members of the public will not be at there we go it's now recording is in progress and that members of the public will not be uh, visible or recorded uh, during this meeting I'd also like to make a territorial acknowledgement in that the resort municipality of Whistler is grateful to be on the shared unceded territory of the Lilwat people known in their language as Lilwadul and the Squamish people known in their language as Squamish. We respect and commit to a deep consideration of their history, culture, stewardship, and voice. Introducing the Recreation Trail Strategy team uh, with us tonight is Shannon Gordon from the Whistler Center for Sustainability Engagement and Planning, uh, who has been working in a role on this project in terms of community engagement and uh, being a big engine behind the scenes in, in developing uh, uh, and supporting content that is being developed by the team at Cascade Environmental Resource Group being led by Todd Halinga and his team, which also includes Nicola Church and uh, uh, Simon Fry. Thank you, uh, who aren't with us here tonight. Uh, joining me from the municipality is my colleague, Lauren Russell, who is a parks planner uh, in the parks planning department and has a long history with trails and trail development uh, in the Whistler area. And last but not least from the municipality is Jill Brooksbank, who is in our communications department and has helped arrange uh, this and uh, much of the online survey uh, uh, administration work. So thank you to uh, everyone there. Uh, following the presentation, that'll be a combination of myself, Shannon and Todd, there will be a Q and A afterwards. Uh, and people can also um, put questions into the chat um, throughout the, the presentation as, as well. Thank you, Shannon, we can go to the next slide there. So the recreation trail strategy, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes reinforcing what this project is and what it is not. Um, it is providing high level direction. It guides how we develop and manage trails and trail amenities. Uh, so staging areas, signage and, and those types of things. It's not a trail master plan. That is to come at some point in the future. Um, the scope of this rec trail strategy are the municipal boundaries uh, of the resort municipality of Whistler. We're considering all non-motorized trail users, and we are actually including class one e-bikes, which are throttle activated, activated bikes, and trial bikes as they are a historical use in the Whistler area. We're also considering new potential users, um, be that anywhere from trail running, and while that's not a, a new uh, use, it is a, perhaps an emerging formal use of our trails and things like forest bathing uh, uses and accessible mountain bike uh, riding. And just to get a little bit more of a fine point on what is in uh, a rec trail strategy and, and what is not, a rec trail strategy looks to answer uh, these types of questions. So. How do we determine the most appropriate approach to parking at any given location? Uh, what is the trail planning review and approval process? How do we determine the right level of commercial event use? And then how do we manage that? And from a trails perspective, how do we determine what is more or less suitable for specific areas? So again, higher level pieces. And a trail master plan is a future project and it builds from the work of the rec trail strategy. So it asks questions like where are new trail staging areas needed and what scale of facility is required? And if we're looking to encourage active transportation, are there improved trail connections that we need to make in order to be successful there? It asks questions like where could new green and blue level trails go to reduce congestion in, in other areas? Uh, where could modification and development of trails for accessible mountain biking and new rider skill development occur? So it gets a lot more location specific and facility specific. Hope that provides a bit more clarity. In terms of the rec trail strategy, where we are in the overall project, uh, we're at the bottom part of phase three where the big gold star is. Um, we've been working on this project for quite some time and developed a lot of content. Um, the first two phases were completed in uh, 2022 and got launched in 2023 uh, with some initial uh, direction survey. So that was the last time we had a webinar and a round of engagement. That feedback uh, was received and compiled and is on the Rec Trail, uh, sorry, the Recreation Trail um, Strategy webpage. Um, and we've drafted some core content, which we'd like to share uh, components of that with you tonight. 
Uh, and now we're gathering uh, community and committee feedback. We happen to uh, work up the Whistler Off-Road Cycling Association, the Forest Wildland Advisory Committee, the Rec and Leisure Advisory Committee. We are lining up a meeting for the Trail Planning Working Group, and we'll be meeting with the Whistler Bear Advisory Committee in their regular meeting in November. So with all that feedback, feedback that we received tonight, along with the uh, engagement that is occurring now till the end of the month, uh, we'll take that information and uh, look to finalize the rec trail strategy and have this wrapped up uh, towards the end of the year. And so tonight with the draft core content, that's what our current focus is. Um, so we took the study area and divided it into 11 boundaries based upon geologic or geographic uh, boundaries and some uh, constructed boundaries, uh, as well as that have a density of trail areas in them. Those 11 areas are on the, the left. Tonight, we're gonna prioritize looking at uh, six or seven of those. And if we have time, we can look into some of the other ones there and Todd will take us through that. For each of those areas, uh, we conducted a suitability analysis that looks from a trails perspective, what is more suitable and less suitable for each one of those areas. That led to some initial recommendations, which are we'll talk about tonight. And then for each of those 11 areas, there's detailed and supporting information. So there's a document that is on the homepage that can be quite intimidating at 118 pages. Uh, and uh, you don't need to read all 118. You can choose to do that if you like. Um, Todd will take us through part of it, but part of that detailed and supporting information for each one of those network areas includes a map, uh, an overview, environmental attributes. It includes an inventory of existing trails and trail related infrastructure, uh, any currently planned trails that are in the provincial review and referral process, uh, access and staging notes, um, and then it includes this trail suitability analysis and, and recommendations. So very comprehensive uh, uh, piece of work. Yeah. And just to add to that, Martin, one thing on the, the document that Martin mentioned that is online, it's sort of labeled the core content document. It's at the top of the documents list on the Engage Whistler platform, which we'll show you. Uh, um, I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, section one includes the suitability analysis and the recommendations. And then if you want more detailed information, section two includes that really detailed information. So we tried to structure the document so you don't get lost in the details. You can kind of take it in bits and pieces. So um, hopefully that um, helps you from getting lost in there. Um, I'll move to this. You can talk a bit more about the suitability analysis. Martin. Sure. Thank you, Shannon. And great points. I think Shannon has also developed a first page guide for uh, people, which has helped me and helps me. And I know the project, it'll really help you too. So um, the suitability analysis and recommendations, they're based upon the area information and those detailed assessments that are in the, the second part of the document. Uh, the suitability analysis, again, it's from a trails perspective, and it looks at high level guidance is what it's intending to provide. So it's not necessarily specific that you need a trail that does this and does that, but more general terms. Um, and therefore, these what's recommended in the suitability analysis and the recommendations that does require more detailed analysis and planning uh, to lead to final decision making and likely would include further engagement uh, consultation and First Nations referral. Um, the trail areas identified as less suitable for some forms of trail or amenity development or more suitable for other uh, elements. And then again, that leads to recommendations which beget, start to get a little bit more specific direction for each of the trail uh, areas. Great. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Um, so I'm just going to run you through uh, just a quick overview of the engagement opportunities and then tonight's session. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Todd so we can dive in. Um, we've had, and, and they've all, they've all been hosted this week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this week, um, Martin and Lauren were out on site at Meadow Park and, li and the library uh, hosting some pop-up uh, open house type booths to raise awareness about the engagement that was that's happening um, to encourage uh, use of the engagement platform uh, and to um, and to just it, you know answer questions and and um, engage people uh, on the topic so those have already happened uh, hopefully some of you saw them out and about 
uh, town. Um, tonight's session, obviously, we're going to, oh, sorry, uh, Engage Whistler. Um, uh, it's the online platform, so engage.whistler.ca. Uh, and that's the main platform, That that is the platform that we're using to gather feedback. So tonight's a Q&A session, um, but we really encourage you to use Engage Whistler to um, uh, to provide feedback. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that next. Um, but um, uh, so these are the three opportunities that we have. Uh, and the Engage Whistler platform, if you haven't already been there, there's a two step process to register if you haven't already registered. So you need to register, provide an email, then you get an e email sent to you and you can you need to confirm that and then you can go back in and, and engage. Um, the sir, we've created a survey tool on the Recreation Trails strategy page uh, that has essentially the eleven trail areas that Martin just took that just that he just presented. The eleven trail areas are in the survey, and then what the survey includes are the suitability analysis and the recommendations. So that core content is on each of the survey pages. So you can review the content and then respond to questions times 11 all the way through that survey. Um, it will, if you want to engage in all 11 trail areas, it will take some time to complete it. The, we're at a stage in the project where, you know, there is a bunch of content to review. So you might want to do it. If you want to engage in all 11, you might want to do it when you have a bit of time. Um, and then you can skip any trail areas that you're not interested in. So do all 11 or do two. Um, it's um, it's totally up to you and you can skip what you don't, what you're not interested in. So the survey tool uh, on the Engage Whistler uh, Rec Trails strategy page, the, the, the survey tool is found at a on a tab at the bottom of the page. Um, and then we've already referenced this core content document. Um, and that core content document is, is presented in the documents list at the side of the page. And as mentioned, it also includes more detailed information. So the survey tool includes the core suitability and recommendations part. And then the core content document includes the additional uh, detailed information um, as well. So you can sort of choose how much detail you want to dive into. You can just use the survey tool if you just want to look at the suitability analysis and the recommendations and answer questions. Um, and then finally, the there's a questions tool also on the platform. And that's just a way for you to ask us questions about the project or about the engagement. Um, you know, as the the engagement um, period uh, is ongoing. So after tonight, if you have questions, you can submit questions via that tool and, and we'll get back to you um, through through the tool. So um, that's a, just a quick overview. If you haven't already been to engagewhistler.ca, uh, you can use the QR code uh, that's there um, to link to it. Um, and then a quick overview just of tonight and what the plan is for the remainder of tonight after I'm finished here is Todd will take us through um, the trail areas that I have highlighted in red. Um, so we've tried to choose the ones that we think there will be the most interest um, in. So Chequemus Lost Lake, Rainbow Emerald, Westside Rainbow, Westside Sprout, um, and then the CRA areas, Whistler Blackcomb. Um, and uh, then finally we'll cover, if we have time, um, Whistler Valley Bottom. And if we have time beyond that, with, um, Todd will also take us through Whistler North. So we'll just see how timing goes. But that's the plan. And, and we just thought we would try and, um, and make sure we get through some of the more popular uh, areas. And um, how we're going to do this, so Todd will present all of these, and you can start to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A tool as, as Todd's presenting, um, and you can start to upvote, uh, you know, live and, and, and do it that way. Um, and then we'll hold the last 30 minutes in the session tonight for Todd and Martin and Lauren to answer questions. Um, and we'll get through as many questions as we can tonight. 
so that's the plan. We'll, we'll reserve about 30 minutes to be able to do that. And then any questions that we can't get to tonight, once time, once we arrive at seven, uh, we will um, respond to them and, and post a sort of a Q&A document on engagewhistler.ca. Um, you know, in a few days following tonight's uh, session. So, um, so tonight is focused really on questions and answers and feedback. Uh, feedback is through the survey tool in Engage Whistler. So as mentioned, um, that's open till October 30th. So, um, and then you can obviously ask questions through that tool as well. So, at this point, before I pa if anybody has questions about process, you can obviously also ask that in the in the Q and A tool. So, if you have any questions about process or engagement, feel free to ask those questions as well, and um, I'll watch for those as I now pass it over to Todd. Um, and Todd's going to start us off with before he dives into the trail. Uh, areas he's gonna he's gonna just walk us through some some overarching sort of themes that apply throughout thanks Todd thank you very much uh Shannon thank you everyone for coming tonight um nice to see a number of familiar uh names on on the attendees list um I know a lot of you have uh, contributed pretty significantly to uh, you know trails over the years, and we appreciate that. Um, as we've gone through the uh, through the RTS, we've definitely um, started to notice some common themes um, that kind of apply through the the entirety of the uh, of, of the Whistler Valley. Really, um, one of those things is additional tra trails and key habitat areas. One of the things we've heard from the beginning of this process is how important it is to account for our environmental values in uh, a recreation trail strategy. So um, one thing you'll see throughout all these areas is um, one thing that we note as less suitable is these additional trails in key habitat areas. So um, that is, you know, less suitable for additional trails in key habitat areas. And that's all based on some of the work we've begun to done, do in terms of the uh, environmentally responsible trail planning. Um, and, and a tool which, you know, should be taken to undergate uh, uh, to avoid or, or mitigate impacts to these um, areas. Uh, and one of the key recommendations from the, the trail strategy at this point is to develop and apply that environmentally responsible trail planning tool um, to all future uh, trail development proposals, management, and, and kind of like an overarching um, part of our, our management. Um, some of the other things we, we uh, noted too is connectivity both within our uh, network areas and between our network areas. So really looking at how, how can you utilize a trail network and travel throughout it and connected to other aspects and connected to other areas and destinations and features. Um, you know, the, another suitable, uh, suitable thing was uh, creating these unique multi-skilled use level and user group trails um, th that we've seen more and more where uh, they're suitable and fun for a wide range of users, whether that's mountain bikers, trail runners, hikers. Um, if it's a mountain bike trail, we're seeing uh, an intermediate level trail that has some options that are, are higher level, or it's just fun to ride if you're a more advanced rider. Um, and uh, finally, you know, just the need for, for a master plan to consider uh, these things in these, these areas uh, kind of collectively to really focus on achieving those goals within each of those areas. Um, and then in terms of some of the community-wide issues that we didn't feel like we could really address at the area level at this juncture are some of the uh, suitability things such as trials use. Like Martin said, trials use is historic um, in Whistler. A lot of original trails were built by trials riders and as non-motorized recreation has grown and, and you know, expanded, a lot of that use has gotten pushed out and there's been conflicting use in some of these residential uh, crown land interfaces. So um, that's something that really just needs a community discussion about, you know, do we want to continue to allow trials use in these places and areas? And, you know, it, that, that needs to be something that kind of takes place before a decision is made on where or if it is suitable. Um, another really important um, thing that needs to be considered is existing unauthorized trail uh, uh, existing trail authorization. 
So we have a large network of trails. We do have a lot of authorized trails and, and sanctioned trails. However, we do also have a lot of unauthorized trails. So even some of the trails in our network that people might think are authorized aren't necessarily. So, um, you know, having a discussion about how are we going to, to bring these into the fold, um, uh, make them official, who's going to maintain them, what are our standards, um, where's the line that potentially gets drawn with future unauthorized trail construction and how it integrates with our authorized trail network. And finally, I brought up the last one, that unauthorized trail construction, you know, there's, there's not a, a whole lot that can be physically done just due to the nature of enforcement and, and, and regulations and rules. However, as a community, we can have a, a conversation and set expectations and um, approaches to how we want to deal with that. So um, it, it's not like Whistler's unique in dealing with those issues, but it is something that we need to consider kind of holistically, I think, as we move forward. Um, Shannon, can I share my screen? Or... Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to stop okay. sharing. And while you get set up, I'm just going to address a couple of things. So I'll stop sharing. You'll share. And um, we just we noticed that um, there's a hand up. And I just want a, a reminder to have questions. If you haven't accessed the Zoom Q&A tool, please make sure that you pull that uh, that you open that box and, and use the Q&A tool to, answer, to, to ask any questions so that we can respond to your questions. Even if it's a comment, submit it that way so that we can keep the presentation going and then we'll get to all questions uh, at the end of the session. Um, yeah, so that's that's just a reminder for how to how to engage tonight. Okay, thanks, Todd. Um, am I ready to go then, Shannon? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So um, I have a map up here that kind of highlights the the main the study area for the RTS. You can see kind of in the southeast from Brandywine up and around uh, Metal Dome and and Brandywine Meadows up to Callahan Lake Park or around the top of Madley Lake, Beverly Lake, Rainbow Mountain, all the way to ancient cedars and then back around the north end by Wedgwoods across to Garibaldi uh, Park and then all along the park boundary through Whistler Blackcomb, the interpretive forest and, and back to Brandywine. And here you can kind of see the boundaries and how how our network areas were really delineated and they're pretty common and based on just people's general uh, nomenclature and use and understanding uh, of the Whistler network. Um, Switching over to this side, so we'll start with the Chequemus uh, zone. Um, obviously, we know this area has become, become extremely important in the Whistler network with the growth of Chequemus Crossing. Um, it's, you know, a relatively lower elevation and less steep area, so it's, it's more um, suitable for a lot of intermediate or beginner um, uh, kind of trail opportunities. And it's used by a broad selection of trail users, including you know, just pedestrians out for walks to see train wreck or the various suspension bridges, um, people going to Loggers Lake for lake access, uh, Chequemus Lake trailhead access, backcountry camping, in addition to just the daily use from our, our local residents who, who use that network to just really get their exercise or mental health and, and all of those things. Um, you know, understanding kind of the nature of that area and what's been happening in there, um, and looking at this trail suitability analysis, um, you, you know, you really see through through the, the work we've done that, you know, uh, additional trails and key habitat areas is again, one of those overarching themes, you know, that really has to be kind of at the forefront of all of our, our thinking about trails. Um, and then specifically, um, additional mountain bike primary trails on that east side of Chequemus River, it's gotten very busy. There's authorized trail construction happening, um, access to the park, um, you know, it, it, it just doesn't need any more, really. Um, additional trails in the Sea to Sky Trail train wreck trash zone, also quite dense uh, in a lot of respects. And there's also a, a lot of staging areas that already exist, in, including official sanctioned um, designated staging areas. So we really don't need more of those. So it's really not suitable for that type of activity. Um, it is, however, more suitable for things like um, mountain bike climbing trail connectivity that improves usability of the network, um, that gets people off of roads, that improves safety. 
um, just looking at that additional connectivity between existing trails, um, you, if you look at the mapping, you'll see there are definitely some smattering of like disconnected areas that have the potential to be connected. Um, further mixed trail rating development, such as intermediate trails with advanced options, just really looking at focusing efforts uh, on sustainability, um, efficiency, and you know, just really getting good value out of the work you're putting into to building trails. Um, there are also uh, suitable options in the, in the area for uh, more advanced trails in areas that are removed from that core network, we'll say right along uh, the Chequemus River. Um, and there's, there's a lot of opportunity for low density backcountry style trails that, that again, provide loop opportunities and just a totally different experience from a lot of the other, other trails in Whistler, whether you're trail running, hiking, or, or mountain biking, which is a very unique experience. Um, and then we get into some of the, the recommendations, uh, you know, for these areas and things we think we should focus on. And like Martin was saying earlier, this is intended to be relatively high level, although throughout the process, we have had some very specific suggestions from people. Um, and you'll see here uh, at the end, we kind of cover that off by, um, you know, addressing those specific, specific items that could be contemplated as part of the master plan process. So I kind of jumped ahead of myself there, but um, one thing we're recommending here is additional trail development. Uh, if there is additional trail development east of the Chequemus River, it really does need to be carefully considered and, and you're focusing on improving your connectivity via short segments or climbing trails over adding um, use specific or single use trails. Um, the, the potential opportunity for shuttles, um, for hikers or other trail users to the Chequemus Lake Trailhead um, to access some of those like popular destinations is something that could really be beneficial as well, just as we look towards um, moving people into alternative access opportunities. And then in terms of connectivity and connections to other areas, as a part of a master plan process, um, you know, we should consider, uh, you know, connectivity, obviously, and those connections, but then improve sea to sky trail connectivity, especially as between Calchak and Brandywine, where there's a large portion of road use, um, potentially like extending uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds up to the Black Tusk Gate. And then just looking at that connectivity between like the Black Tusk Gate, Sea to Sky Trail, Jane Lake, Lake, Lakes Network. So those are some specific items that have been identified that should be a, a part of a, a review in terms of a master plan process in the future. Um, and there was one additional one, just potential for additional loops in the Jane Lakes area and connectivity down to Brandywine Park while maintaining the character and that wilderness character of the area, which is really important. So that's kind of the, the checkmiss section. And um, uh, yeah, just as you scroll down um, to find the next one and I'll, um, can you, could you just um, remove the, um, you know, the paragraph marks and things just take that button off just to clean it it up um and also if you put your cursor out like um you should be able to get rid of the gray so just so everybody knows oh, sorry. Todd Todd is using the core content document right now um as a way to to run us through the content so then it'll be more familiar uh to you when you when you jump into it I'm sorry how did I get rid of the gray <laughs> just put your cursor maybe maybe it won't work that's I've just never seen it all highlighted like that um but can you just put your cursor on something else like up at the Lost Lake title just out. no yeah no okay. okay that's fine so, so I don't know why it's doing that everybody but yours when you open it it shouldn't appear well yours won't if you open it because you 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 all will be opening a pdf document not a word document um so sorry about the gray but um uh that's a bit I apologize. Better. I should have asked yeah. earlier. I was going to, and I didn't. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. I'm sure everybody, um, yeah. document is less. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Lost Lake, um, and I apologize. I should have brought this map up first to, to show you, uh, just what the, the Chequemus area looks like again. Here you go. Just for reference. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. So I will, uh, move to, uh, not Callahan. Not that. Lost Lake Park. Um, Crown of Whistler's uh, 
park system, I would imagine. Uh, you can see it's kind of, you know, bordered by the developed area of uh, Whistler Village, back Blackcomb Benchlands, um, golf course, and then kind of bordering into here along uh, Green Lake Loop. Um, as we know, this is like our, our very important village park. It has a wide range of user groups, including, you know, um, pedestrians, tourists, sightseers, lake users, um, trail runners, uh, beginner and intermediate mountain bikers, um, you know, obviously the cross country skiing in the, uh, in the winter. So it's, it's very important. Um, it provides predominantly beginner intermediate terrain, very rolling, um, a lot of cross gravel, uh, uh, trails as well. Um, very popular tourists and, and young families as well. Um, it, it's also very popular for, uh, mountain bike instruction courses. Uh, and also trail running, mountain bike events, including Warka um, and, and uh, camps as well, children's camps. So um, it became fairly evident that this area is less suitable for additional trail development. It's very dense. There's a lot of trails in this area. All of them are very well used. Um, it, it is more suitable, however, for pedestrian only trails. We do know that the mixed use can, um, you know, see some speed differentials. Um, looking at active transportation connections and amenities just to really encourage people to be traveling to the park um, from alternative transportation methods. And then just really looking and focusing on refinements uh, and adjustments to existing trails is also one of the, the suitability um, findings. In terms of the recommendations for Lost Lake, it's really just to maintain that continued focus on your, your beginner and intermediate trails and your pedestrian only trails. And, and really looking at um, continuing to promote and enhance those active transportation opportunities and, and really encouraging that use across the spectrum of, of users in the park. Um, given that high density of trails, we just really also need to consider refining and rerouting existing trails uh, over building new ones. Um, and then really just look at working on increasing the trail maintenance and repairs and um, you're looking at maintaining those experiences over time. I apologize for my dog barking in the background. Um, apparently she's very unhappy right now. Um, um, so we can move on to uh, Rainbow Emerald. Yeah. See. Rainbow and Emerald here. There we go. So this is focused on um, the, the no-flow zone as it's affectionately called and as we all know it by. Um, mostly surrounded by, you know, active, active development uh, with the Rainbow Network, uh, Emerald Estates, and then, you know, some good chunks of Crown Land. Uh, we have One Duck Lake in here and connection up towards the, the Cougar area as well, um, bordered by Highway 99. Um, yeah, it's primarily a, uh, a local use zone. Um, it, it's not overly known for dest as a destination tourism area or anything like that. Um, and as I was saying, it's like, you know, decades ago, it was called the no flow zone. It's known to be chunky, sharp rock, rocks, uh, awkward spacing. Um, but you know, it's just kind of reputation has persisted, persisted. It's hard for experienced users and, and a lot of intermediate users find it very hard and intimidating. Um, in terms of the suitability analysis, it's less suitable for you know, those additional trails and key habitat areas. And it'd be really challenging to try and do a, a green trail in this area, just given the nature of the terrain. That's not to say it couldn't be done, but it, it would be, could potentially be you know, very challenging. Um, it is more suitable for those, again, connections, reusability loops, and looking at the Valley Trail connectivity, which is a challenge given that the Valley Trail is located on the opposite side of the highway, but there are some options out of the Rainbow Network, uh, Rainbow Neighborhood to access that south or western side of the of the area. For our recommendations, it's just really you know focusing on maintaining that character and nature of the area and really be focused on that neighborhood and community use, um, which is really important. Uh, in this day and age, um, carefully consider blue level connectivity without really um, 
impacting that, that kind of characteristic or nature of the area. Um, but it would provide a little more opportunity for, for um, some different skill levels in those local communities to use that a little more. Um, you know, really looking to try and preserve that overall low moderate density. That's a big challenge in areas that are close to neighborhoods, just how people use forests adjacent to where they live, whether it's dog walking and trail, trail building. Development. We really want to focus on um, uh, avoiding creating too much density. And then just looking at that connectivity between your other areas as a, as a part of a future master plan process. Okay. We're going to jump right into the uh, West Side Rainbow. Uh, West Side Rainbow. Oh, wait, that's West Side Sprout. I apologize. Let's go West Side Rainbow. As we move from the, the Rainbow Emerald Network, um, obviously, this in in encapsulates uh, much of the Skywalk Network, which the Alpine Club uh, Whistler Chapter has you know, been working on over the years and has provided an excellent destination hiking, alpine hiking resource to the community that's extremely popular. Um, it has some very important mountain bike trails, especially kind of in the Alpine Meadows area, such as Howler or Billy Epic, which really... Um, they provide some like the ability to have a wet weather use um, and really high impact events without a lot of damage. So what we do see is there's like a lot of different types of trails in a lot of these areas that provide a lot of different um, types of um, trails for a community um, that we really need. And then it's bordered on the south side here just by 21 Mile Creek and, and the Rainbow Trailhead. Um, we did have some feedback at an earlier meeting last week about potentially bringing the, the river runs through it and uh, Emerald Forest uh, Trail networks into the Valley Bottom uh, network, which is a, a recommendation we may um, employ. Um, so just to build on that, um, you know, the, this area is just really kind of steeper, more technical. So some of the trails we see in that area uh, are providing more of those more higher level advanced um, experience options. Um, there has been a lot more unauthorized trail development near to the Alpine Meadows area, especially around Rick Truce, which has caused some um, neighborhood conflict issues. And um, it, it's kind of one of those ongoing things. Um, additionally, we do know that th there's some parking issues related to the uh, Skywalk network in the past um, is also something. Um, in terms of suitability, you know, and again, the, the key habitat areas and that environmentally responsible trail planning is really key, especially as we know the alpine component has the grizzly bear recovery, and that's going to be continuing to happen over the coming years. So just really focusing on protecting key habitat by employing that, uh, you know, developing and employing the ERTP. Um, and it's really not suitable for additional mountain bike descent trails in that immediate area adjacent to Alpine Meadows where it's become quite, quite dense and, and busy. Um, we also said it was less suitable for green trails. However, I guess there, you know, there's always that, that potential. It just could be something that's a, a lot more effort given the nature of the terrain. Um, this area is more suitable for a designated staging area. It has been noted as a, a deficiency and some of the, the uh, approaches that have been employed have worked somewhat, but not always. So um, it, it could be suitable for that. It's suitable for mixed trail rating development, intermediate trails, advanced options, um, mountain bike climbing trail connectivity, which just improves the overall usability of the network. Um, it allows some other user groups to, again, get off the roads if they need to or want to. Um, and then really, you know, again, those key connections and thinking about that concept, I think, is really important. Is like, how, how do people use the, the network and how can you create unique use for those networks? And based on that, the recommendations are to to continue to monitor that grizzly bear recovery and use in the Alpine area. And I know that's happening and everyone has a lot of eyes on it, but just like being, um, being able to quickly uh, adapt and amend to any changing conditions is, is really important. Um, we are also recommending establishing an appropriate staging area that would support the rainbow and skywalk um, network use. 
uh, there's also a potential here to, for a shuttle to that Skywalk trailhead, um, kind of much like we were talking about in the uh, Chequemus area. And then just trying to, you know, maintain that connectivity to the active transportation network, um, just to encourage that alternative use, um, you know, as opposed to getting in your car and driving there. Todd, as you move to the next one, I'll just, uh, your timing's perfect. We have three to go on, on the schedule and 15 minutes, so kind of five minutes per. So there may be um, time for an additional, but I just wanted okay. to let you know that you're doing great. Thanks. Um, we'll just jump right over into West Side's throat. So it's kind of sandwiched in between the West Side Rainbow and the Callahan and kind of extends all the way up to, to Beverly Lake. This is obviously another very critical part of Whistler's trail network. Um, from the Rainbow Trailhead, you know, you have the hiking only Rainbow Trail, um, you know, mountaineering route up to Rainbow Mountain, um, access out to Beverly Lake, and then of course the the whole Sprout Alpine network, which, you know, the, the community came together to help uh, plan and develop uh, over the preceding almost decade now. Um, you know, also we have that core, what we like to call that core west side network that would run from, you know, about the flank trail and below and then from industrial disease, just above Function Junction, all the way to the Rainbow Trail is probably one of the uh, busier and heavier use areas in the valley. And, um, you know, just due to its proximity from our residential neighborhoods, um, it has the destination component with the Alpine network. And it's just an area that has a lot of reputation and lore for, for trail users to come and visit. Um, the other kind of couple of key things about this area too is that we have um, the, you know, our source water protection plan, which protects the, the watershed. That's where our community gets its surface water for drinking. Um, so that's a key um, environmental consideration we need to make when we're, we're talking about potential development in this area and management of trails. And the other is the uh, grizzly bear human conflict management strategy, um, which we all know is actively used in terms of, um, you know, communication, opening and closing of the network to respond to uh, bear issues and whatnot. So those are some, some important things to remember. Um, but this area really is like it features Whistler's most historic and popular kind of technical mountain biking and hiking trails. Um, both authorized and unauthorized and it provides a lot of access to those popular alpine destinations um, that people are really trying to get to um suitability it's less suitable for for additional trails and key habitat areas and we do get into this in more detail in the recommendations and that it becomes more apparent here um the the core lower sprout area from about nita lake up to um we'll say into the mystic has really has a, a pretty high density of trails. So there really is no need for additional mountain bike descent trails in that core area between industrial disease and Rainbow Lake Trail. And again, just due to it, the, the steepness of the terrain, it really be hard, a challenge to put in green trails. Um, this area is more suitable for a staging area for that core sport road access. It, it has been identified over a number of years as, as something that is, is lacking. Um, there are a couple opportunities for additional mountain bike climbing connectivity, um, just to improve that experience, usability, and connectivity. Um, mixed rating trail development, which is happening just with things like Chipmunk Rebellion. Um, and then just, you know, focusing additional trails off of existing infrastructure that's been completed in appropriate locations. Um, really looking again at connect connections inside the network and to other areas outside the network. And, um, you know, looking at that enhanced Valley Trail connectivity, although, uh, you know, on the west side with Alta Lake Road, that might require um, some enhanced thinking, although it's a little easier on the function end uh, out of olives, or not olives, uh, forecast, sorry. <laughs> I'm dating myself there, but that's not even the oldest one. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, recommendations for this area, um, again, that ongoing monitoring of the wildlife and habitat values in the Sprout Alpine, we know this area is busy. Um, we know there are some important values there and just really continuing to enforce and focus on the source water protection and grizzly bear management strategies. And 
again, really refining and amending them as necessary. Things are changing quickly. Grizzlies are moving into more areas. So what do we have to do? Can we refine and, and adjust what we're doing? Um, we are re recommending avoiding all trail development in a couple of identified grizzly bear habitat areas. Um, there's a couple of uh, spring foraging areas and the gin and, gin and tonics like basin has been identified um, as being really important habitat. So those just really aren't important, uh, important to avoid. Um, there were some Alpine network trails discussed throughout the uh, trails planning working group and the Alpine, the Sprout Alpine process um, that were a couple were, um, I can't remember if they're approved or they were planned, but just to, they've been kind of put aside or deferred, I guess, um, just waiting to see what happens related to that wildlife and source water consideration. So just put them aside, see what happens in the future and, and revisit them at that time, potentially can consider them in terms of the, the master plan process or hold them there. Um, and really, again, considering and planning for new trails carefully, given the environmental sensitivities, trail density, um, potential intensities of use, staging area considerations, and other constraints. Um, and then as, as important components of a well-planned network, there are a few uh, trail um, development things that we think we should advance support of. One is in process, of course, which is the Mystic Function Warka Section 57, hopefully receiving some kind of authorization in the near future. Um, there's been some work on a beaver pond reconfiguration um, with, uh, with Stonebridge and uh, how they're contracting, and that would be improve safety, reduce the, or take away the exit onto the Stonebridge Drive, get people off the road. And then as a part of the uh, Sprout Alpine project, the RMW did flag and plan a, a connection climb that would go from uh, Lower Sprout to into the Mystic. Um, so we're recommending that get, um, you know, pushed forward as well. Um, establishing some form of staging area in that Lower Sprout area is also a recommendation just to help support managed access into that core part of the network and provide that landing area for people to uh, stage out of, to do their, their rides up into, uh, onto Sprout. Um, continue to just monitor that effectiveness of your opening and closing Sprout Alpine stuff, your strategy, um, just to continue to maintain those outcomes. Um, it's working so far and you wanna keep it doing that. Um, maintaining the trials moto access on those historically used trails in the area. Um, new authorized trail construction is being done as non-motorized, so it, it's probably not suitable for those trails, however. Um, and then just again, looking at your additional trail connectivity um, to other areas in a master plan process. Um, I'm gonna jump over Whistler North there. I believe we're to the CRAs. I know these are of yeah. uh, a lot of interest um, to everyone. Um, even though they are all controlled by Whistler Blackcomb through their master development agreement with the province. So um, what we're intending to do here is provide some information to Whistler Blackcomb to help their understanding um, and importance of these areas and the public use trails within the CRA um, from a community perspective to hopefully help guide any management that they're going to do on these trails. Um, so for the Blackcomb CRA, we see, you know, Garibaldi on the northeast and on the east and southeast, the Whistler CRA um, to the southwest, and then the Blackcomb Benchlands, obviously, to the north. The primary use area for the um, public is obviously just above the Benchlands here up to the, the Glacier Rescue Road, and, and below is that primary use area, and it provides access into Whistler North and comfortably numb. Um, the, oops, I apologize. I'll just show Whistler quickly, Whistler CRA. Um, same thing from the, from the Northeast. We have the Black Comb CRA. Um, Whistler's challenging because it has such a large uh, commercial component in terms of the bike park um, kind of in the main village area and now Creekside, in addition to their Alpine hiking trail network as well, which connects to Garibaldi Park. 
And um, it also connects down here into what we would say are the historic public use trails on kind of this uh, northwest side of the CRA that abuts the interpretive forest and um, the neighborhoods on the south side of the highway there. Um, you know, all of these trails are, I would say, uh, if we start with the black comb is, you know, particularly popular with, um, we'll say downhill oriented trail riders. Um, so more of the enduro, um, they want to climb up and go down. It's less cross country, more aggressive. Um, there, there's a number of advanced and expert level trails there. Um, the lower areas on the bench lands also, uh, host, um, what they call cross country Olympic. So national level and provincial level um, cross country races. Uh, there's been running races in this area. So it's actually black comb is very important from one like a high impact uh, riding perspective and also high impact um, events. Um, and that's become kind of a, a critical part of what's happening there just in addition to like the notoriety and popularity of those very much mountain bike primary and, and specific trails. Um, the Whistler, Whistler CRA trails get a little more uh, complex in between the village and Creekside. There's a large number of unauthorized trails, which um, have, have, have been challenging, we'll say, for the land manager, um, more towards the southern part uh, around Bay Shores. We have the historic Tunnel Vision, um, Kyber Pass, uh, all those kind of trails. And there's been a lot more collaboration with Whistler Blackcomb and Warka, especially as related to tunnel vision and some trail development that's happened in that area that's been authorized. So there's some really good examples of collaboration between some land managers and user groups um, to complete some work in that area, but you know, really provide some classic um, historic trails that the community finds very important. Uh, and in terms of our, our suitability analysis, and again, just kind of repeating those same key themes about habitat areas and green trails and, and focusing on mixed rating development and connectivity. Um, in, in terms of recommendations, I think this is hopefully what we hope like Whistler Blackcomb would take, take away is that, um, you know, on the Blackcomb CRA, that style and character of those like advanced downhill oriented trails um, with some more intermediate options uh, kind of lower down is really important. It's become a huge part of the network. We hear it over and over about how like critical it is to so many riders. Um, and, and it's really important to manage those trails as an important component of our network because if they went away, it could cause significant impacts on other parts of our trail network that we may not anticipate. Um, and we really, you know, we'd like to see that continued support and use of that area as suitable for races and events, um, whether that's X, XC, cross country, enduro, Warka, club events, um, trail running, uh, you know, all of those types of things. It, it's just been really good for that. Um, in, in terms of the Whistler CRA, just continuing to work with Warka to support and manage those those public connectivity trails down on that kind of tunnel vision area, which, which provide important like off-road connectivity into the Chequemist trail network and vice versa from Chequemist back towards, uh, you know, Creekside and, and whatnot. It just gives people that, again, that option to do a lot more riding or running or walking um, off of roads on trails and be able to get to other trails um, in a connected manner. Um, you know, really maintaining that West Ridge as an important historic valley to peak or peak to valley route, you know, both, we know it was an important hiking route and biking. And, you know, we know that the bike parks uh, having impacts outside. So just really trying to, you know, maintain that, that historic link from peak to valley. Um, and then just trying to minimize the impacts of that Whistler Bike Park Trail de development on those historic public parts of the network um, between Chequemus and Creekside. Um, it, it's certainly a challenge and, um, you know, there will be changes. It is their tenure area. However, the community does have an op opportunity here to, to tell uh, Whistler Blackcomb that, you know, these are the things that are important to us there. Um, I will jump into the valley bottom here quick. So the valley bottom mostly just covers off anything that isn't, wasn't in one of those other areas. There's not a lot of trails in the valley bottom. However, it does 
contain a couple of, of relatively important ones, primarily uh, the Kuiper Bars area in Nestor's right by the elementary school. Um, it gets used a lot going in between. Oh, I'm going from, you know, one side of the valley to the other. People use it as a connection. It's used for a lot of like uh, skills building. You're able to do lots of different laps and practice. Kids use it. It's an important community amenity and a, and a neighborhood amenity, really. Um, uh, Blueberry Hill um, has some connectivity from Tapu's Farm over to Alta Vista. Um, it's, uh, you know, mixed, mixed reviews on it, I guess you could say. And then um, also we have identified here the uh, uh, Cadenwood um, Big Timber area. My apologies. Um, but overall, um, relatively basic. As I mentioned earlier, there was a suggestion we should incorporate the Emerald Forest and the river runs through it areas into the Whistler Valley bottom, um, which we're, we're um, taking under advisement. Uh, in terms, uh, yeah, that's really, it's really important though. It provides that connectivity uh, through the valley. Um, you know, we have said it, it's not necessarily suitable for more blue and black development. There has been a little bit in the cut your bars area, but it's kind of like, it's kind of reaching density as well. Um, additional trails and key habitat areas, um, it's not as important in this kind of, uh, uh, you know, environment, just given that it is a developed urban um, kind of area. Uh, it could be more suitable for that mixed rating development whether green with blue or blue with black, et cetera, connectivity in, in between your areas and just, you know, folk connectivity to the Valley Trail, which is great through the Valley bottom because that's our hub. That's our, that's our spine. That's our backbone of our active transport or, or some people's active transportation network. Um, for recommendations, considering upgrades to Blueberry Hill trails, just for that usability and sustainability. Um, we get a lot of foot traffic in there as well. Try to go to the docks. Um, and just looking at exploring some staging opportunities for park and trail use to, to try and control some of um, some of the, those impacts that you see. Um, do I have time to jam Whistler North in there or? <laughs> oh, sorry, Shannon, I can't hear you. Sorry, I think you do. We only have one question so far to respond to. So unless everybody's been saving them, it's going to dump them in at the end. But uh, yeah, so yeah, the answer is yes. And then okay. if people want to start adding in questions, if you've got them, that would be great. We can start to have a look at your questions, get ready to respond. Okay, um, I was going to go to, sorry, which one was it here again? Oh, Whistler North. Whistler North, yeah, you're there. <laughs> um, yeah, so from, you know, Highway 99, Green River, uh, up to Wedgwoods, bordering the, the park and Lost Lake, we have this Whistler North area, obviously we have Green Lake Loop was the historical route through here. Now um, we have the Sea of Sky Trail, which connects through to Wedgwoods and, and Pemberton and beyond, and obviously down to the south. Um, the other kind of key thing is that comfortably numb, that historic um you know, in the epic that kind of is almost like an upper backbone. And now we've seen, you know, more trails kind of coming off of that. Um, there's the Parkhurst area here, which is, uh, you know, now municipally held uh, parcel, which covers a portion of this. And then there's uh, obviously some industrial use, tenure use and things like that. Um, I, I won't mention habitat again, but just additional trails in that Parkhurst area over the past, you know, five years or so, there's been a, an exploding in, in trails in that area, both um, from, from across user groups, um, which has kind of started to impact that, that potential future RMOW park. Um, could be suitable for staging area amenity improvements in the Wedgwoods area. Uh, we know that's become a, a pretty big hub for people to uh, stage out of for their, for their trail use. Um, you know, again, just looking at maximizing your use with mixed rating trail developments and, and focusing on that connectivity, um, as opposed to just straight up new, new trails, um, for, for recommendations, um, you know, just exploring opportunities with the trials group to formalize some of their existing trails in their playground trials area. Um, uh, you know, providing, a 
a place where they know they won't get pushed out, I think is really important at this point, um, as, as there has been a lot of displacement as trail use has changed over the years. Um, and then the RMOW has identified developing a, a park master plan for the park first lands that really focuses on trail requirements for access, connectivity, user dispersion, and any other um, municipal park needs that, that could be required as related to a park of that nature. Um, I think I've talked myself, uh, not quite hoarse, but almost there. Um, I don't think I have anything to add. If anything, if anyone else wants to add something. That's perfect, Todd. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, what we'll do now, we've got a couple questions that have um, landed in the Q&A. So Martin, um, Martin will respond to those two and give you a, a break, Todd. And um, yeah, uh, I just want every uh, my team to know that my the Q and A tool for me has just stopped responding. <laughs> so Martin, you're muted, but over to you. Yeah, thanks, Shannon, and you've frozen as well. So um, thanks, Todd, for Perfect. all of that there. Um, Great summary. We look forward to more questions coming in. So there's two questions uh, or four questions in there. I'm only looking at the first one at this point. Um, Westside Rainbow area is one of the largest in the valley with some of the lowest density of trails per square meter relative to the neighborhood proximity. That is a correct assumption, but in part has the lowest density because above the flank trail are the Alpine trails, which is a very large area with few trails below it. Uh, below the flank trail, the lower elevation terrain is well suited to provide community connectivity, and we are getting concerned with habitat fragmentation that there's uh, a lot of trails that are, are um, in that area, um, and that uh, we need to give that careful consideration uh, going through uh, there. Um, would it be possible for this to still occur given the designation the report? Yes, that's part of the reason why we are conducting the engagement process is to receive feedback from uh, the community uh, about these things. I hope that sufficiently answers that question. Um, the second question we have here, uh, the focus of planning contains main mentions of environmental impacts and how to consideration, but still does not define capacity of trails and of Alpine used accessed by helicopter or other aircraft in the longer term. So the purpose of the record trail strategy is not to do a capacity study. Uh, one of the outputs of the strategy, so another phase like the trails master plan will be to do a limits of acceptable change study. So a limits of acceptable change looks at things from an environmental as well as a social and user experience perspective and, and ask the question, what is the amount of change that is acceptable uh, before there's negative impacts to uh, that? With regard to wildlife and particularly in the Alpine area on Sprout and Rainbow, we take our direction and cues from the uh, ministry of, uh, or from the province uh, and the conservation uh, officers, as well as the grizzly bear uh, specialist. And we have uh, reached out to them in the past to uh, have a, a meeting to talk about where things are going. And we haven't been able to secure a date for that, but that is, is ongoing. Um, sorry, I lost that window. Uh, so what is the build-out capacity of trails and what percentage is has to be avoided and left undisturbed and protected to give wildlife a place in the valley? Again, our primary focus for that uh, area would be the limits of acceptable change study and uh, better understanding what the, the those impacts might be. Next question was what data, if any, was used to support findings of trails area being more busy or less busy? Uh, trail counter, trail for example. Uh, all of those uh, pieces were were used, and I see Todd, you'd like to sure. talk about as well. Yeah, um, we both had the yeah the Armour W counter counter data, um, which is kind of scattered amongst the uh, around the valley. So you get these little snippets, and we also did a very um, a snapshot Strava heat map analysis, which basically had three categories: low, moderate, or heavy depending on how bright the heat signature was um, in the data. Um, we understand there's limitations to that, but we were interested in a snapshot of just the overall um, you know, use patterns in the valley. And it gives you some information on, on how that, that works. Um, so we understand that it's more of a, a qualitative component. It's not like a hard and fast, there were X numbers on this trail and that trail because we can't get that level of data. Um, 
but um, it, it was just, just tended to provide some kind of uh, sense uh, of the overall intensity of use in those areas. Um, and I could jump into the next question as well about trail density. Um, that's something that, you know, we had first done just the you know, meters of trail in, um, you know, the network area and done the math to determine what your overall density is. But given the, the variation in size of the areas and some are very large with, you know, no trail development in it, some are smaller with lots of trail development, it kind of didn't make for a very useful metric. Um, so we've been exploring some other opportunities to try and, and get a, a more consistent density um, calculation that could be applied more, um, I don't want to say fairly, but just more accurately to determine, you know, what the overall density is as related to other trails in, in that immediate area. Yeah, thanks, Todd. And just picking up on that, and the trail density, yes, you can develop a, a quantitative uh, density tool or, or some type of thing, but really a lot of it is also about environmental considerations and the qualitative uh, experiences. In some places when the trail density gets too close, uh, too tight, then uh, it detracts from the experience uh, of users. You're always stopping to figure out which way to go or you're seeing other people or people start to further braid uh, the network by creating uh, shortcuts. Uh, so those are things that we want to consider as well. Um, it also needs to reflect the terrain uh, type and so forth. Uh, next question there is about the strategic planning committee. Uh, and where is it at? So where did that question go yet? Um, it's not released actions and strategy for the balance model, which we hope will produce a sustainable level of tourism industry and residential development and balance uh, undisturbed and protected wildlife habitat. Will trail planning follow the balance model or will trail planning carry on before the completion of the balance model? I don't have an update on the timing on the completion of the balance model. It is work that is active and ongoing. Again, the rec trail strategy is intended to be complete this year and provides a higher level of guidance. We've also been directed by council to work with uh, smart tourism as one of our strategic priorities. So I think the short answer here is for the rec trail strategy is that yes, we're trying to figure out that balance and uh, provide guidelines about how we make decisions about uh, what is too much and too less or could be more. Uh, when we get into the trail master plan as the next phase of this project, uh, then that will have more uh, emphasis on uh, balance and smart tourism and um, and so forth. The next question is, I understand there's a history of gas powered bikes. However, with the challenge of greenhouse gas emissions of the resort and the continued growth of CO2 in the atmosphere, should it be discouraged to continue the use of gas powered bikes in our planning? So more specifically, uh, what the gas powered bikes is referring to are trials uh, motorcycles. Uh, and for those who don't know, uh, they a lot of the current, well, I can say a lot, but um, some of the original mountain biking trails uh, were using trails that were constructed by the trials motorbike uh, community. Um, and that's a great question. And again, that's one that uh, we'd like to hear feedback on from, uh, from the community on. I think Todd's got a, an insight there, Todd. I don't know if inside or, or just a, an additional comment that um, the other thing to remember and consider is that uh, electric technology will change very quickly in the coming years when it comes to motorized recreation. And that includes trials bikes, dirt bikes, mountain bikes, a, a lot of different things. So um, the emissions, while it's a, an important aspect, um, doesn't necessarily solve an issue as related to um, other other considerations when it comes to motorized use and mixed use. And are there any further questions or follow-up questions, comments? I'm, I'm back. Hi. Sorry about that, everybody. So there are no other questions. I just want to make sure I'm not lagging behind um, where we're at. Are we finished with the questions, Martin? And Yeah, it would seem uh, okay. so. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, if there aren't any other questions, then um, maybe just a few thoughts on next steps. Um, Martin, if you uh, want, and I do, maybe I'll, I don't need to pull up that last slide. You can just speak to it, or do you want sure. me to pull up that last slide? No, that's slide? fine. If you got some technology challenges there, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> So in terms of next steps, the uh, public engagement session is open to the end of the month. So we encourage people to um, complete the, the sur online survey and so forth. And certainly you can reach out to myself directly uh, uh, as well if you have questions. Uh, we will take that information and compile it. Um, and then that'll lead into development of uh, uh, the final document, which we will be uh, reviewing and working on uh, for, for years end. Great. Super. Thank you. Um, and sorry, my camera's not working. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody. Thanks to, to those of you who joined us tonight uh, for taking the time um, out of your evening uh, to be here. We, we, we were glad to have, to have you. And Todd, thanks for running us through it. Jill, for your support. Lauren and Martin as well. Um, thanks for walking us through the content and uh, answering the questions. So um, yeah, with, if that's, if that's it for everybody, we'll, we can sign off. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you, everyone.